folks. I'm going to kind of put some caveats out there before we start this segment because I'm not really mm-hmm. sure how it's going to go. Right? Um, and I think the couple things I want to make known as one, this is something I've talked with Zena about pretty mm-hmm. immensely already. So Zena's on board. Zena's kind of feeling out of it, dealing with a migraine right now. Um, so they will jump in if they need to, but I think this is going to be a primarily me talking one. Um, whatever, that is, whatever Jess says, like assume that it's coming from me too. That's yeah. So here. if you add me, you're adding Zena, you know, yada, yada. Yep. But, Cause this is stuff we talk about beforehand, obviously. Mm-hmm. The next thing I want to say is that there is a trigger warning, trigger warning for sexual assault for um, transphobia, transmisogyny, etc. We're not going to be talking about specific cases, but I want to talk about something that I think is important to me because otherwise stuff gets rough. Make sense? Um, the last sort of caveat is, is that this is going to be done, um, again, around no specific cases or whatnot because, um, yeah, I'm not going to feed that drama machine. And harassment and lies are not okay with us. Mm-hmm. So, what I want to talk about today is sort of the intersection of a couple things. We talked about on this channel before um, the notion of transmisogyny. That is, the intersection between the bigotry that transgender people experience and the misogyny that is pre-existing in society. This was a phenomenon that was um, discussed and created... or created as far as the term by Julia Serrano, author of the whipping of whipping girl, fantastic book. Transmisogyny is sort of something that she talks a lot about. And I want to make sure we have a clear definition before we move on. So she says, what is transmisogyny? My 2007 book, whipping girl is probably best known for two things. It popularized cis terminology, which I did not coin and introduced the concept of transmisogyny, which I did coin a bit with a hyphen transmisogyny. In intervening years, many people have taken up this language, often using the wor- these words in ways that I hadn't anticipated, which is perfectly fine as language is always evolving, and I am not the gatekeeper for these words. However, there are times when others have criticized me for usages of terms I never forwarded myself. The basic argument I made in Whipping Girl goes something like this. What feminists have long called sexism actually consists of two fo- f- forces. There's traditional sexism, which is the notion that femaleness and femininity are inferior to or less legitimate than maleness and masculinity. But in order to maintain that hierarchy, there also needs to be a way to discourage people from blurring or transversing these distinctions. I call that force oppositional sexism and define it as the belief that female and male are rigid, mutually exclusive categories, each possessing a unique and non-overlapping set of attributes aptitudes, abilities, and desires. In other words, transphobia as well as homophobia stem from oppositional sexism. Makes sense so far, right? Do you have any questions? Just bump in. While all trans people experience oppositional sexism in the form of transphobia, those of us that are trans female or trans feminine spectrums face additional scrutiny due to the specific direction of our gender transgressions. That is, towards the female or feminine which are both delegitimized due to traditional sexism. I call this particular intersection of oppositional and uh, traditional sexism transmisogyny, and over the course of Whipping Girl, I provided many specific examples of how it plays out in our lives, especially in regards to common stereotypes, media depictions, uh, psychopathologizing theories, and sexualization. Some of these points are also discussed in in the collected pieces below. Part of why I'm writing this now is that I've seen this term increasingly debated online lately. These debates are often centered more recent terms of TMA, transmisogyny affected, and TME, transmisogyny exempt, which I did not coin. I have no objection to TMA or TME per se. They seem like potentially useful, non-binary, and non-identity based ways of discussing the phenomenon. But I'll, I'm admittedly not familiar with everything that others are saying or claim under this new rubric, newer rubric. So there may potentially be some points of disagreement. I do know that some of these debates relate to precisely who is impacted by transmisogyny and who is not. I share some of my thoughts on these matters in the follow pieces below. So we'll get to that in a little 
maybe later, maybe in another thing. But I just wanted to give that base idea. So transmisogyny is the intersection between traditional sexism and what she calls oppositional sexism. Oppositional sexism is defined in this regard as violating the gender norms and sex and 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 the the rigid norms of what your gender is supposed to be. The idea that these gender things are not just essential essentialized, but absolutely discrete categories with no overlapping, which is just utterly nonsensical. So how does that work then, right? So she talks about this stuff and we go on and she talks about her primer. So let's go to the primer because the primer is the PDF. Let's pop this open. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Transmisogyny is steeped in the assumptions that femaleness and femininity are inferior to or exist primarily for the benefit of maleness or masculinity. This phenomenon manifests itself in numerous ways. Studies have shown that feminine boys are viewed far more negatively and brought in for psychotherapy far more often than masculine girls. Psychiatric diagnosis directed against the transgender population often either focus solely on trans female or feminine individuals or are written in such a way that trans female or feminine people are more easily and frequently pathologized than their trans male or trans masculine pot counterparts. The majority of violence committed against gender variant individual targets individual uh, individuals targets individuals on the trans female and feminine spectrum. That's not to say that other groups such as, you know, uh, trans masculine, trans men, non-binary, xenogenders don't suffer violence as well. But if you look at the data, majority of it is based around, at least if we're talking about physical violence in the form of assault, um, any type of assault, um, this tends to be against trans women more often than not. Um, um, I know there's a couple questions in chat. If I can just say real quick. Keep hanging on with us. This is a really large term and there's a lot of understanding with us. So if it doesn't, if it takes more than just this video for this to gel, that's okay. There's a lot here. Okay. And if there's some good questions, feel free for Matt, uh, mods to transport those over to the site chat so mm -hmm. I can see them because we will try to answer them as we can. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, lastly, in the media, jokes, demeaning depictions of gender variant people primarily focus on trans female or feminine spectrum people. Often these days, it is their desire to be female or feminine that is especially ridiculed. While trans male and masculine individuals are often subjects of derision, their desire to be male or masculine is generally not ridiculed. To do so would, uh, would bring the supposed supremacy of male or masculinity into question. So I want to kind of come back to that. Like, the idea that... There is not transphobia or sometimes harm towards other gender, you know, gender um, um, non-conforming individuals is just not the case. There is. However, when we're talking about specifically femininity, there is a way in which the transphobia that is leveled against trans masculine people seems to be very different than the transphobia that is leveled at trans feminine people. Mm -hmm. This is not to say that one is best, better, or worse than the other, but what we're just trying to understand is when we talk about the way trans feminine individuals are interacted with, not only do they suffer transphobia, that is to be transphob to, to, to be trans is to be bad. But to be feminine is also a backstep. It is considered actually a degrading. It is less than. It is looked at as best case scenario, comical. At worst case scenario, a danger. Now hold on to that last part. The fact that it's looked at as a danger, right? If you've seen uh, Lindsay Ellis's talk about uh, discussion about trans um, transphobia in, in media, this is covered really well. Mm -hmm. In earlier media, the idea of a trans woman or a man in a dress, as, as older stuff showed it, was in and of itself not a problem. Some Like It Hot, a very well-known movie with, uh, with Marilyn Monroe, 
literally has two guys dressing up as girls and being around women and, and literally trying to sleep with these women in some cases. And this is looked at as, as funny. This is the com this, the, this, the movie's a comedy. But then you look at things like Psycho. Now, is Psycho about a trans woman? No. It's about a psychotic person with multiple personalities who is lashing out and has a multiple personality of his mother. Silence of the Lambs does not have any trans people in it. It has a psychopath who is wanting to steal the skin of women to be some sort of to be some sort of you know some sort of monstrous thing but people think that buffalo bill is a trans woman buffalo bill is not in fact they go out of their way to say in the movie that he's not bill's not a real transsexual but he tries though and then they go on to this thing talking about how transsexuals are genuinely not harmful people and generally want to be left in peace this is the thing. The perception in media we're talking about is, by its nature, not always the media itself, though people are bringing up Ace Ventura. Ace Ventura is transphobic as fuck. But it's something about the way that people interpret it. People look at Buffalo Bill and think, trans woman. People look at Psycho and think, gender nonconforming femme. The reason for this is, is that femininity is looked at as lesser than and being trans is looked at as deviant and degenerate. And so if you are trying to be a woman, think about it. Yeah, as Rusty said in chat, trans mass people uh, is AFAB elevating their status, which does not subvert the status quo. That's about at least where I was going to go in that direction as well well i would say it doesn't it doesn't subvert the status quo as far as the masculine it's still being trans i don't want to get into the language that they're somehow not suffering transphobia and i do think there is a phenomenon that needs to be addressed at some mm -hmm. point though not for this video about trans androphobia because there are ways in which the dangerousness of men is projected onto trans men sometimes and i do think that's a discussion to be had but we are talking about specifically trans misogyny yeah, to be clear, just we cannot handle all of these topics at once in one video right now. And especially when it comes to, you know, transandrophobia and how those systems work. No, they're super there, but we're also still digging into those and still trying to get language around those. Mm -hmm. Serrano's really, really great at some stuff. I actually want to dig more into her work, but, you know, she is one person speaking on this. So you're just going to have to hang in there with us, you know, until we can kind of do some more research, get some more language and makes more videos on those topics. So, so one idea then said, when you say trans femininity as seen as, in da as, as danger, do you mean that in a greater, uh, greater danger than trans masculinity? Now that I think about it, I've not seen any media where trans mass person is the crazed killer. Correct. You never see the mm -hmm. trans mass person as the crazed killer or the person that's trying to either sexually assault or murder women. You're ne it's never, it's never looked at oh. as an actual thing. Now, are trans men sometimes framed in, in, in inappropriate ways? Absolutely. But even the fact that there's the hyperfixation on trans feminine in media, right? Trans femmes, by definition, as Rusty says, make no sense within concepts of patriarchy. And as such, trans masculine people almost, if you want to be, I suppose, derogatory, look at it as is looked at as a way to uh, increase your station. Right. As opposed to. As opposed to being trans femme, which is looked at as subversive, damaging and harmful. So what do they project upon us? And we get into this. Perhaps the most physical example of trans misogyny is the way in which trans women and others are on the trans femi female feminine spectrum are routinely sexualized in the media within psychological, social science and feminist discourses. And in society, society at large, for example, the media not only regularly depicts trans women bodies and experiences in tint, uh, titillating and lurid fashion, but they also sexualize trans women's motives for transitioning by, tra tra by portraying them as either sex workers, sexual deceivers who are preying on unsuspecting heterosexual men, or as male perverts who are transitioning to female in order to fulfill some kind of bizarre sexual fantasy. So this is the thing. We talk about this with the autogynophilia video ContraPoints did. There is literally a way in which 
we took transitioning as a trans woman and made a pathology out of it. Autogynephilia, Ray Blanchard's notion of autogynephilia is pathologization of trans women. And you'll notice there are no ways in which trans mass people are pathologized in the same way. That is not to say they're not pathologized, but nowhere to that that, that level. Well, and I, I will fill in this caveat, or not caveat, but this part here. Okay. Notice that um, they're not pathologized in that way, but notice that there's a lot of silence being left on that side of things. Okay. There's still stuff going on, but it's much more silenced. All right. Um, unless they're talked about. And so that has its own effects, but just that's the flip side here. Okay. That causes problems on its own, just different problems. So that's all I got. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about this, understand the way in which this functions. While trans men may face a certain degree of media objectification, I mean, look at um, Elliot Page. Yep, if yep. anything, those who are proje uh, who, who project ulterior motives onto trans men generally presume that their transition is in order to obtain male privilege rather than for sexual reasons. Thus, the presumption that trans women but not trans men are sexually motivated in their transitions appears to reflect the cultural assumption that a woman's power and worth stems from the ability to be sexualized by others. This was especially true if you look at the way in which trans women had to be sexualized in order to actually get HRT and, and, and surgeries back in the DAY. If you look at the 70s, 80s, and 90s, in her book, she talks about how you had to not only perform femininity perfectly, but on top of it, you had to be sexually attractive to the doctor. Think about how fucked that is. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Goddamn. You had to be sexually attracted. That means they had to experience you as a woman. Yeah. With trans mask Their individuals. Own subjective experience, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. With trans mask individuals, it's infantilization. With trans femme individuals, it's monsterization. True. Please also recognize that these things are different. Not that one is worse than the other. If you go into the, well, this is worse, you've lost the point. They're both bad. They just do different things. Okay. And we're all in the same community yeah and i would say the only time com conversation about which one is worse is when you're talking about very specific contexts right if you're talking about situations where the dangerousness of men is being projected i can make an argument that androphobia is actually something that is projected on both amap people and afap people mm -hmm. i can also talk about the fact but that again that's that's more of a androphobic issue not a trans androphobic issue the fact that that's put on trans men and begin them becoming men now gives them that dangerousness would be a trans androphobic issue the thing here is with trans misogyny when we're talking about this it gets dangerous because people can start getting really uncomfortable about mm -hmm. the notion about are we talking about some way in which this group has a, a more difficult experience? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. We have to be honest about that. I am far more likely to be murdered and assaulted by a partner than other people. That's not to say it can't happen to them. And it's not to say that it doesn't happen at a higher frequency to trans people. This is not the oppression Olympics. Mm -hmm. We just are trying to talk about these averages because this stuff affects us all differently. And trans femmes, in some ways, do get... There seems to be a lot more outward violence, like physical outward violence. Well, you get into this problem where in a lot of cases you have the issue of being hyper visible because women are supposed to be visible and supposed to be, you know, being able to be objectified and also putting the freaks on display kind of thing. And because this is a violation of patriarchy that no one would ever want to do this, so they must be doing this for some ulterior motive, by definition... You want them on display, which then means they not only get the most sexualization, the most objectification, but they also get the most likely towards those outward forms of abuse. Trans mass people tend to get infantilized. Non-binary and xenogender people get ridiculed. You're not real, is the idea, which is nonsense. Mm -hmm. So why am I bringing this up again when we've already covered it? So... If you've read our recent statement, and I'm not going to go into that situation, so don't fucking ask me and don't bring up any names. 
And please don't, you know, make posts about it in our chats. One of the things I see as a large issue on the left is that we are torn between all of these different exalted virtues. Yes. Right? And so what happens in a situation when a trans femme is accused of sexual assault? You know, it's a good example is our We Spa videos. Look at our We Spa videos. Yeah. Where this person is looked at as some sort of degenerate. They must be some sort of, you know, awful pedophile. In rea reality, this is a trans woman who was poor, who was a sex worker, and basically plead down a deal. And right. Again, and those things aren't even on the books because they've been so long since they've happened. So. You know, we had to dig through this to actually look at how stupid California's laws were on, on getting indecent exposure charges. They're real easy. Um, mm -hmm. so think about like this, a trans woman gets accused of sexual assault. What do we do in those situations? As progressives, we want to believe victims. It is the idea that we want to believe victims because again, not only is that the ethical thing to do, but from a just false positive perspective, statistically, we should believe them anyway, because the likelihood of it being a false allegation is relatively low. We've talked about this on stream before, but anywhere between roughly nine to three percent if we're being generous, closer to six to three percent if we're being real honest. So we've just got done talking about transmisogyny. And transmisogyny is something that affects all of us. It is mm -hmm. encoded into society. And you can see this on the online left because there's occasionally times where suddenly people will get real weird about trans women when they feel like that trans woman has been, you know, done something not great. So here's the thing. We're torn between these two things. A trans woman gets accused of SA the natural tendency is to want to condemn her and attack her because we want to believe victims. We have the belief that we need to believe victims. But from a demographic perspective, just like we just covered, trans women are often hypersexualized and there is a tendency to frame us as sexual abusers or pedophiles or any number of things because again, we must be transitioning for some hidden ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. because of a sexual kink, because of trying to get into women's spaces, any number of things. Internalized transphobia, right? We unintentionally have internalized some of the society me messages about us or about people in our communities. Internalized transphobia is a bitch. Yeah. So you have this issue where you're now in a conflict. We want to believe victims, but we also know trans women are more likely to be accused of this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's where I would bring this up. And I've seen some people try to argue with me on this with Twitter, but they're just wrong. Presumption of innocence, or, and I'm going to butcher this, but e incumbit probato qui deceit, or what it basically says, A person is presumed innocent until proven guilty, right? Here's the problem. This comes from, if you've done your developmental homework, from a rational perspective. And a lot of our views on the online left come from a post-rational or post-modern perspective. But just because something comes from what is, quote unquote, a lower stage of development doesn't mean it's wrong. All stages of development have truth built into them. Just it's true but partial. This is one of those things that I think needs to be brought up because it's very real. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Feels like the common thing is believe all victims unless they're trans. Yeah, yeah. So it's either you don't believe the victims or you don't or you immediately attack the, the accused with no understanding of presumption of, in, presumption of innocence. What I'm trying to say here is that we have stated on this channel from the get go. Mm -hmm. This has been something we have been consistent on. Ask any of our older fans. That one can simultaneously believe victims, 
while also continuing with the presumption of innocence. I know that feels like cognitive dissonance, but I don't care. This is a values issue, not some logical proof. Well, and the thing is that, yes, there's cognitive dissonance, but that's the point. Recognizing that and actually being able to work through that dissonance is huge, and we have to work through that somehow. One of the arguments I've heard against this is the idea that within communities or within small social groups, the idea of presumption of innocence isn't helpful, and it's just a law thing. My retort to that is that law by its nature is supposed to be a state, nationality, tribe, whatnots attempt to codify ethics. Right? We can believe victims, believe survivors, while also simultaneously withholding judgment against the accused. Yes, so, uh, social psyche ex uh, psych explainer says, I feel like believe in this case ta means take the allegations seriously, not automatically assume said allegations to be true. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I would, that's what I would hope believe means, but also not everybody, you know, seems to always act like that. You can all say on that one. Yeah, well, and again, D Dark Slimeo said, uh, well, there's the court of law and court of public opinion, right? Yes, and I think there's a problem with that because... As progressives, as individuals who claim that we are leftists, this is built into the idea of human rights. It's in an inter international human right under the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 11. This is a human right that we grant people. To me, to think that the court of public opinion supersedes those human rights is to me horrifying. This is a thing that we need to hold up in our communities as a means by which to prevent unnecessary harm to all involved. That includes the accused. Why do I say that? Because on this channel, we don't believe in retributive justice. Yep. We don't believe in the idea of punitive and harmful measures unless we have no other choice. And so the problem is, is that when we, by definition, forget some piece of this puzzle, what it inevitably ends in is some form of harm, either immediately by attacking the accused without pro real provocation or evidence, because it makes us feel good. That retributive violence feels good. We want to hurt them. We want to make them feel bad because that will somehow bring justice. But in reality, that's not going to happen. It won't bring justice and it won't bring resolution either for that matter. Correct. Retribution does not get the victims therapy. It does not get them resources. It does not actually teach the accused of anything. This is why recidivism rates are so high. If punitive measures worked, they would be working. They don't. And so whether mm -hmm. we're talking about in the legal system or we're talking about within our online social spaces, to me, these shouldn't be different. And it actually comes off as incredibly hypocritical to believe in wanting to remove the punitive retributive aspects of our justice system and then allow things like canceling and harm to happen in the way that we do. We'll talk about it in another segment, but Sarah Zed's recent video covers this really well. The way in which mm -hmm. a group of people will start through outrage, come forth and start this type of harm. And the whole time, there's never a way in which real reasonableness is given to the situation. Yeah, as Tima said, retribution is not constructive. It is not helpful. Retribution ultimately is a most brief, a brief moment of feeling better. Yeah, yep. because it makes you feel better in the moment. It makes you feel good. It's easy. It feels like an easy dunk, but the problem is it's not. Well, and that is the most diff one of the things I see a lot of people struggling with doing any kind of activism see, right? The immediate effect you don't really get to see. You don't really get to experience that. The long-term effect, you got to wait for. You got to wait slowly for change. And not everyone, not everything in the world does. Not every system that we are fighting against with activism does. 
But this is a balance to play when we're doing activism is that we are doing work that we can't get immediate gratification from. Yeah. And here's the thing is, is that I can give you examples of on the online left where stuff like this has happened. Great examples of retributive justice. The attacks against Natalie Wynn. Yep. Mm hmm. The attacks against Lindsay Ellis. Notice, by the way, all these people are women. The way in which people will believe with such certainty that a trans woman is guilty of certain crimes directly connects to trans misogyny as the definition we've given. Uh, YouTube chat, uh, what is this? Pladness12 says, there's also a potential fe awful feedback loop because of the demonization of trans people where intercommunity policing becomes an even more extreme version of accusations from the outside of it. Yeah, because we're so afraid mm -hmm. of being looked at as degenerates and, aw and awful people, we become much more harmful yes. than the outside world. Remember, these are the outside world wants to keep trans women from using bathrooms for fear that someone's going to be a trans woman fakely or something like as though, as though being a trans woman means the assault rules go out the window but that's not what happens right well the outside the level that the outside world is going um here's a a, a levels thing right yeah um they are acting in a way in which still keeping trans women out of you know public spaces right but if you are also, you know, enacting on people, hey, now you can't even be in a space that is safe for you or should be. That's a whole other level of harm going into this, right? You are escalating that harm with this. Now, I want to be really clear with something. What I'm pointing at here, what me and Zena are pointing at here is the idea that there is a very real way in which. People, when they hear this argument always straw man it what i am saying is is that we need to look and check our biases and privilege in regards to these situations because just because you are another trans femme or trans woman does not mean you're not acting with trans misogyny look at gammy trans misogyny is very real it creates harm it creates damage and so the problem is is that when we don't stop and consider those biases that we all have in regards to making and in regards to interacting and choosing to engage with punitive action against accusations, we are continuing trans misogynistic trends of over sexualization and assuming that we are predators. That is not to say that we don't listen to the victims. As I said before, we believe victims because it's the ethically right thing to do, and because from a statistical standpoint, the false positive issue comes into effect. That is, the likelihood of someone falsely uh, accusing someone is very, very low. On the other hand, we also need to not demonize and vilify trans femmes when these types of things come up because what that does is it creates isolation and it creates harm. And it doesn't lead to any kind of truth. It just makes us feel better. Or at least some people feel better. Yeah, the other people are horrified. Yeah. Now, the way this gets straw man is people will say something to the effect of, well, you're just saying this person shouldn't get any kind of punishment. They could just be in the community doing more harm. I didn't say that measures shouldn't be taken to alleviate potential threats. If someone has been accused, viewing them as innocent until proven guilty does not mean we take no action. In the legal system, this comes up as probation or not probation, but um you know, bail, bail bond or that kind of stuff. I forget the terms. I'm not a lawyer. But there are ways in which a person is still observed and watched and the behave, and, and behave towards in a way that does not impugn their innocence per se, but it does create measures to deal with the situation. There's no reason we can't do these in online spaces. Um, we do have a question from when I'd heathen, and I actually want to take that question and also put that into content suggestions because I feel like that would be a really good video to have a good brainstorming on to give people a larger, uh, you know, toolbox for this. Because clearly we don't have a toolbox and people need one, all right? So the question is, so since we on the left support things like restorative and rehabilitative justice, what are some ways to practice these forms of justice when people in our communities are doing bad things? Do we want to handle this now or in a few minutes? Oh, uh, we can handle it. Yeah, we can handle it in a few minutes. Okay. We'll come back to this then. So 
understand, and people are getting confused by terms, retributive justice, punitive justice, I would say are a Venn diagram. I would say the same thing with rehabilitative and retro and, and um, restorative justice. Um, but again, definitions may vary between different people. My point here is, is that when we are talking about human rights, when we are talking about the way in which we interact as communities, we have to thread the needle between believe victims and maintaining presumption of innocence. The loss of presumption of innocence is a return to retributive justice, honor killings, and just raw vigilante action. It is the person getting strung up for touching the woman inappropriately before they've ever had a true trial. They just get lynched. They, it, is the, it is the person who is immediately stoned to death without any real evidence showing they did this. It is everything you can think of in history where a person did harm or people did harm to somebody who may or may not have been innocent. The problem is, is that I believe in the notion that we have to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. There's a line down here that I actually think is really great. Let me see if I can find it. I was reading this the other day and I actually thought it was kind of based. It is better than it is better that 10 guilty persons escape than one innocent suffer. I agree with this wholeheartedly. Absolutely. Yeah. Because if our forms of justice inadvertently harm innocent people these systems do not work we talk about this with the death penalty we talk about this with dna records and people coming out later and finding out that this they were this person was innocent the idea that there is an acceptable an acceptable level of collateral damage to innocent people just so we can feel better through outrage and harm is by its nature something that flies in the face of every other leftist value. The reason why this is so hard is because we as human beings have a desire to act out in a punitive or retributive fashion when we feel hurt, scared, or upset. When something is scared us sufficiently, we will act out and we will justify any sorts of atrocities. As I've said in the Zen segments, anger isn't the problem. It's fear. Mm -hmm. Violence comes from fear. Because if you're afraid of something sufficiently enough, you can justify any action to it. If you're afraid that ContraPoints actually did hate non-binary people, you can justify the, ha the, the harassment campaign. If you're afraid of the fact that Lindsay Ellis is this horrible racist, then you can justify anything towards her. This is how we do what we do in war. We dehumanize people. We call them terrible names. By essentially not examining these ways in which we think, we inadvertently create a scenario where trans femmes are going to be more likely to be held to some sort of punitive measure when these things may or may not be necessary. I know that's not satisfying. I know that doesn't feel good. I've been dealing with it for two weeks. Trust me, I get it. It doesn't feel good to have to hold yourself to your values. Yeah. It feels good to shit post on Twitter. It feels good to lash out at someone you know to be somehow bad they're ontologically bad. I feel good about that. There's no such thing as ontologically bad. People are people. You tell yourself those stories. You tell yourself black and white stories as a means by which to justify the punitive action. People are never that simple because that's the same reasoning, the same outrage that liberals and conservatives use to attack African-Americans where they say, oh, well, they did this, they have to pay for the crime. Not looking at the social s systems and the economic systems that led to these outcomes.
or trans femmes will be held to an impossible standard or they will be expected to prove a negative. Yeah, yeah. I have to prove a negative. You can't do that. Yep. Do you think, Jess, that punitive logic leads to gatekeeping of trans health care? Um, Wait, what? Where are we at? Maybe. I'd have to add, hear more about that. You might have to go into more detail. But... That, that yeah. seems like a slightly off-topic question. Yeah, bring that in context, Jess. We'll talk about it more later. Yeah, but yeah. the point is this is that this is not just even a question of world is gray. It's that this is basic holding to our values, at least the values we hold on this channel. I think it is possible to support victims. I have. I've had clients who are sexual assault victims who are have dealt with childhood sexual abuse. And let me be clear. That stuff sucks. It sucks going through those sessions. It sucks for them. It sucks revisiting this stuff. But you know what? We, say, we hang in there. We go into hell together and we come out the other side. We deal with this stuff. I hate that this happened to them. I have the same in, the same human urge to want to, in roadblocks, rip the, other, rip the person who hurt them apart. But we can't give in to those urges. We can't give in to those tendencies because to do so sacrifices our entire values we can support victims while also maintaining presumption of innocence. I don't support, Xena doesn't support, cancel mm -hmm. culture or call out culture or any of the other names you want to use for what essentially amounts to mass online harassment. Because it makes mistakes. It goes after the wrong people. It also doesn't have a limit. It's a thresher machine mm -hmm. that has no real end. Look at the fact that Red Lindsay, what was it? Like ContraPoints got canceled for the Buck Angel thing and motherfuckers were pulling out shit from years back about lizard people. Vosh does something that pisses people off and people will bring up a fucking document that is every bad thing he's ever done. There is no forgiveness. There is no willingness to actually work towards restorative justice. I've also heard it said that some people think that in order for restorative justice to happen, there has to always be an attempt on the person who's, who's receiving that justice to want to change. And I don't know if that's always true. I've seen people who have gone through therapy court mandated therapy come out the other side and be and be okay do they want to go change no but sometimes by being in that situation they do well and if you're talking about somebody who hasn't had access or hasn't had a chance to access those systems finally being given it well yeah no like we absolutely should be providing those opportunities you can't watch the zen segments and tell me that the ego the self is an impermanent construct that comes in and out of existence and then tell me that people can't change. You're changing moment to moment. Mm -hmm. You can't hold to some spiritual value or some philosophical perception of Zen and then try to somehow have this incredibly hypocritical way of thinking about people. People are not permanent. They change, they shift, they grow. Everyone being on this segment right now with us having this talk absolutely is capable of change and growth. That's the point. That's why we're here bringing this up. Everybody watching us and continuing to watch this video is capable of that and can take this stuff with them and, you know what, take it out to the world around them too. So, just to make this really clear, for anyone who has an issue with presumption of innocence, this is viewed as a fundamental right in modern democracies, constitutional monarchies, and republics. This is found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Law, or Rights, excuse me, Convention on Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Do I need to go on? Hell, the Constitution of the United States doesn't split, uh, uh, doesn't cite it explicitly. It's widely held as part of the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments. These are human rights. This isn't just a law thing. This isn't just, this isn't just a courts thing. This is a way of holding yourself mm -hmm. in the world. You can come at any situation online and immediately 
either presume innocence or presume guilt. My belief is this. Any accusations against trans femmes, and trans people in general, as a matter of fact, but trans femmes specifically in this case, by definition, need to be held with a grain of salt, not to the exclusion or harm of the victim, but especially when we're, when we're holding the notion of presumption of innocence, because we know that people will jump onto this stuff due to trans misogynistic means, because they will assume that the trans woman's a deviant. They will assume that she must have an ulterior motive for transitioning. They will assume that she must have done these things. Because this is the same shit that fucking turfs throw out about bathrooms. It's built in. We all have these things. Just like internalized racism, just like any other thing, we have to question our experience. So with that said, mm -hmm. if anyone has anything else, we'll talk about more in, in the future segment, yep. but I want to make it clear. I am not saying that the accused should not be in some way watched or s action should not be taken to make sure people are protected in case those accusations turn out to be true. What we're saying is punitive actions and reactionary tactics will never be accepted on this channel. Mm -hmm. When you're acting like Kiwi Farms. The alt-right group that tracks trans people. Yeah. Guess what? You've lost the plot. If you are so interested in retribution, when you're so interested in mobbing that you start taking on the tactics of reactionaries and Nazis, of TERFs, you have lost the plot. And with that, we'll see you in the next one. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, consider donating to us. You can support us on our website, transgirltherapist.org. You can also help us on our Patreon, link below, or you can become a member here on YouTube. Um, thank you so much for watching.